Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to introduce Hegel's Science of Logic, Wissenschaft der Logik, going over the book and some of my handwritten notes and I have here with me so there's no written paper. I will be, I will be trying to think through the beginning of the science of logic. Some preliminary remarks. The first one is if you'd like to study Hegel and Trone idealism more closely with me, please follow the link in the description of this video to my course on German idealism. Also, anyone who stumbles upon my videos is of course invited to support my work here. Now on Hegel, preliminary remarks. Dialectics in Hegel is not thesis, antithesis and synthesis. When you hear that, aim for your guns and run for your life. You are now dealing with someone who hasn't read Hegel. Hegel Hegelian dialectics has got nothing to do with thesis, antithesis and synthesis. In fact, Hegel actually ridicules to a certain degree Fichte for his very superficial understanding of dialectics. That's the Fichte understanding of dialectics, which is, again, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Moreover, there are thinkers, commentators such as Heidegger, for example, who claim that Hegel is a foundationalist, if you want to have a label for it, so that Hegel tries to provide a ground, a stable, permanent foundation for beings. That is not the case. By the way, this has implications for Heidegger's so-called history of being and his critique of metaphysics in general, which Heidegger, I think, probably wants to divert from, but that's for a different uh, time to be discussed. Moreover, and one final preliminary remark, is that Hegel does not invent an artificial language, as Kant, to a certain degree, did before him, and as Heidegger does after him. Hegel speaks from within the German vernacular. The German language breathes through Hegel's work. And of course, then, the task of translation is one that is most pristine, most important. Let me briefly say something on the Vorrede zur ersten Ausgabe, so the prelude written by Hegel himself for the first edition of The Science of Logic. Here he notes something crucial. There has been a völlige Umänderung, a complete transformation, which philosophical thinking has undergone, has suffered from for the past 25 years, he says. Which is what? The collapse of the metaphysical dimension, we could say. What Hegel notices and sees is that dogmatic metaphysics, the metaphysics of Leibniz and Wolff, for example, the names don't matter. What matters is that the access to that realm of the monad, etc., that dimension has collapsed. What remains, then, is the attempt to raise logic from a mere organon, a tool, to metaphysics itself. To a certain degree, that happens, or that is already well, not made possible, but in some sense attempted by Kant in transcendental logic, but is only really fulfilled, brought into fruition, brought to fruition by Hegel. Again, without a metaphysics, he says, a people is, and this is my word now, um, is homeless. The metaphysical dimension, that's the, the insight. The metaphysical dimension has collapsed. When we move then to the Anfang der Wissenschaft, the beginning of that creation of knowledge, of what can be known metaphysically, of, of, of this, well, it's a timeless, um, a timeless transhistorical moment that we're entering into. He asks, the, the title is, is a question. Womit muss der Anfang der Wissenschaft gemacht werden? How does one, or how does the beginning of the science be made or be 
attempted. And he says here, in, in recent times, only in recent times, there's been a certain uh, consciousness or awareness that's emerged that it is that it be difficult how to find a beginning for a philosophy. And the ground or the reason for this difficulty, as well as the possibility to solve it, has been discussed by many people. The beginning of philosophy must either be something mediated or immediate. And it is simple to say that it is either the one or the other. Now, we don't have to worry maybe too much about immediate and immediate just for now. But what's important is that what begins to be the question already for Hegel is how to come into, how to arrive back to the origin, to the source, and hence how to make the beginning, how to begin. One will have to, he continues a bit further down, to, again, I think this, this need to return, in some sense return, we have to be careful with, with the notion of return, but to find, not, not return, but to, re, to find or recover the source again, the origin is necessitated exactly by after the collapse of the metaphysical dimension. One will have to, he says, admit that it is essential, an essential observation, that moving forward, vorwärts gehen, is ein Rückgang in den Grund, is a moving back to the ground, to the source, to the original, das Ursprüngliche, and the truthful. So, so-called progress is not a stepping away, a fortschreiten, that is a stepping away, a moving away and beyond, but is a moving back into that which is the origin. The beginning of the science of logic, which we will read in a second on being, nothing and becoming, what's important, I think, is to take Hegel seriously, that this thinking here is one that is genuinely attempting to be presuppositionless. Without any presupposition, hence it begins with being pure being, being pure being and nothing else. The And there's no preposited, that's even more important, final goal. The idea, the absolute or the absolute idea are not presupposed in the beginning. This is what Schelling thought. This is to some degree what Hegel, uh, Heidegger, sorry, thinks that is going on in Hegel's science of logic. There is no horizon towards which Hegel thinks here. So, <clears throat> the science of logic is to some degree already then um, really distinct from Kant's transcendental logic. I'm going over my notes now. Kant, um, is still very much trapped, one could say, not purely, but there is, formal logic is not entirely sublated. He understands, um, well, in a sense, the, the focus on the understanding in Kant leads to a, a focus on, or a, relapse, a lapsing back into formal logic. Hence, what formal logic, or sorry, what transcendental logic does is to project categories of formal logic to the objects of experience. But that leads Kant to being unable to get behind the presuppositions of his thinking, it runs into the antinomies. Um, one of the reasons why Hegel suspends with old presuppositions is, of course, in, let's say, it is. Kantian transcendental logic, what happens in the first um, critique, but this is not just historical context or so. There is, and this is, we cannot really separate the historical from the systematic anyways, but what we, what we can see is, so not trying to contextualize it, he says it's because of Kant, what Kant bursts open allows to see is how, well, 
is that if, with this condition, we keep up unquestioned the presuppositions of thought, the presuppositions of the so-called also laws of thinking, such as the principle of non-contradiction, then we remain, well, sorry, we, we end up in aporias. And the aporia is the breakdown of thinking. We cannot just stay with the aporia. The aporia is perhaps an invitation to think further and try to not solve it, but to uh, overcome it. But to end with aporia is sophistry. I'm not saying that Kant is a sophist. Be very careful. But to when you hear someone say, let's end with aporia, that, that has a tendency towards sophistry. Kant himself is not a sophist. That's not what I'm saying. But there is... There are aporias in the first critique which have to do with the presuppositions that are unquestioned. So Hegel wants to have find a new concept of what Wissenschaft is, of the science, which is not pure mathematics or geometry, and certainly not tables of categories, but the nature of content, which moves in scientific knowledge which are moving, though. They're not dead. They're not formal. Formal logic for Hegel is a skeleton. It's nothing organic. So the, the, the concept of science that Hegel is after is an organic concept. Dialectics is what moves itself or is self-moving. Formal logic does not move. It's dead. Maybe very, also very briefly, the, the, there's a distinction in Hegel. Um, so Kant privileges the understanding, where Hegel does not privilege reason over the understanding. Both are moments in the logic that are necessary. The understanding has the task, as it were, and this, all, this comes from Kant, he sees this in Kant, they're not faculties, by the way. Right? So it's not a faculty in the soul back. What, what the understanding and what, what reason are are, uh, uh, um, are moments of thinking. They are not potent uh, potentialities that are to be waiting there to be actualized. So again, reason and understanding are moments of thinking. They go towards subject and object. The understanding is that which corroborates the general in contrast to the particular, to the singular. Thinking must begin in such a way, it must make a beginning. So without the understanding, thinking would not set in. There would be no inception of thinking. It holds tight to the abstract. That's what it wants to corroborate. Because, well, because it can, what the understanding is capable of is to distinguish, in some sense, between what is sensually perceptible, perceivable, and that which can be thought. There is a corroborating, then, as it were, of of the of something that is seemingly determinate. The understanding is the standing, as it were, of finite things, but reason is the art, if you like, the moment of letting go. We'll say more about this in a second. Reason reason dissolves, as it were, the determinations of the understanding. And it dissolves those determinations into nothingness. So, for example, identity and difference which are not there in the beginning of the logic, but they are developed further on, they come about. Those are categories or species, rather, of the understanding. They are not of reason. So, the the determinations, as it were, they must be thought in and by themselves rather than having a clear-cut 
schema, you can maybe think of this, what, what the understanding there does is to schematize, whereas what, the, what reason is trying to do is to open up this schema and to think those determinations by themselves. <clears throat> and also maybe importantly that um, for the skeptic and those who are more prone to well a negative dialectics these, these, these moments of dissolving they are just as it were a collapse it all just collapses down to nulla to nothingness but no, th th this dissolving is not a complete destruction. It's a success. It's th the moment where something collapses and moves over into the next. A category is formed that imminently, which remembers all the moments that, that went before, that have come before. Or else sublation aufheben wouldn't mean all that it means and also of course there cannot be a pure difference as perhaps the understanding would like to see again why so the beginning of the, the science of logic begins with with empty being and we'll get to or pure being we we'll get to this in, in a second why is it that this has to begin with being pure being. One cannot begin with the concrete, but only with the immediate and the abstract. The concrete general, would have, so concrete means congressure, to grow together. That, that you cannot presuppose that which has grown together um, in, in thinking. And then and then uh, uh, deduct from it or deduce from it. That would be a mathematical approach, very much the approach of Kant. However, Hegel thinks, to, thinks through the self-sublation of the abstract. That's important to notice because Hegel, this is what it says, is not constructivist. There's a tendency towards constructivism in Kant. Language, as I said in the beginning of this, is only there when it's spoken. Language does not live in dictionaries and language does not live in books of grammar. It's that's so again it's it's the, the language that breathes through a thinker such as Hegel is one that is itself spoken. It's so philosophy thinking, the philosophical thinking, lives from this presupposition, as it were, of language, but also frees it to. So there's a freeing of that language to this higher realm of, say, metaphysical logic that was almost a bit too representational this language but it is a freeing of language to itself as it were to show its true content i think that's better put than this representational language of moving towards a higher realm but you can see how this very easily uh, comes in this way of thinking and it can of course help to illustrate but at the same time it must then we must let it collapse <laughs> Uh, and, and show the, the other way through the other way of saying that, um, that, that the representational thinking, um, well, it doesn't necessarily fail, but uh, as it were, stifles an access to thinking itself. So contents, again, true content is never immediate. Even representation will have to admit once you say something, you know, like the realm, the higher realm, etc. You're already actually presupposing a lot, um, and so an ex. What's I, I'm leaping ahead a bit, but anyway, I'll say it. Concepts for for Hegel are not uh, subsumations of of representations as they are for 
for Kant, concepts are developed and to develop, they develop themselves. There is movement within them. They come only after we have seen the essence. So the science of logic by Hegel is a contrast to the tradition. Logic is usually understood as an organon, that's to say an auxiliary tool, but not the core of what is at stake. Kant's transcendental logic, and so also Fichte's, already alters this relationship to, or our understanding of logic, because here knowledge or recognition is understood as logical. <clears throat> So a dialectical thinking that shows itself here will, of course, make, as I said before, make a distinction between the understanding and reason. The understanding is is a is a is an epistemology or a knowledge that's based on principles. But reason or a science of reason will mediate between principles that are not presupposed, but as it were, spring up imminently through the movement of thinking that thinks itself itself. Dialectical thinking is or will systematically differentiate between a thinking of thinking itself and, of, and an anthropological and a psychological thinking. So, this is not a psychology or an anthropology in Hegel, obviously. Hegel's logic is an attempt also to derive, no, not derive, to develop entwickeln, to, to let unfold or unroll from within imminently as memories of what came before the categories. So the categories aren't posited on some table that no one knows where the table of categories came from, but instead those categories are developed imminently, unfolded imminently. So according to, um, sorry, and yeah, so I just, as I just said, Kant, for example, names 12 categories, but he doesn't show uh, the continuum or the unity, um, for example, um, how are they? How do they go together? How do they hang together? As we can say in German, "Wie hängt das zusammen?" It's um, the, the 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 problem with with uplighting of categories, so with deriving or deducing categories, uh, with 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 Hegel is again they are they there is a there are presuppositions then at work that cannot be. I think you could say rain that cannot be reined in or cashed in. We can't really. It finds then. Um, it, it always has to move back behind itself, um, rather than trying to attempt to reach down into the genuine origin. Every category is an absolute form, and its content and form together that make up, as it were, thinking. The, and and in, in Hegel's development, content and form, of course, in the development of the categories, they go together. They're not purely separate. There's no table, again, of, of just the categories that are then applied to life, as it were. So, um, we can only think through life and what it means to be according to content. There is no pure form or formalism. I won't go into nature just now. So maybe also something that's important on the regarding Marx. Even though it's the logic is pushing ahead and moving towards the absolute idea, which shows itself at the end, this, you know, the richness of being entirely 
entirely unfolded imminently. This is not to say that what we are dealing with here is a work that is a priori determining what will be. So it's a mistake to apply, as Marx does, the movement of the logic to a linear development of time. By the way, this is very important to realize when you deal with certain critiques of capitalism or certain claims about capitalism and artificial intelligence and all of this gobbledygook that's out there. Um, so the science of logic does not allow us to see the future a priori or to deduce the future a priori <clears throat> because it isn't a corroboration, as also he Heidegger thinks wrongly, the science of logic is not a corroboration or a holding tight of all beings a priori. That is not what's happening. Marx thought, again, I say it, that the dialectics allows one to see the future. The dialectical movement only occurs when differences or distinctions are taken seriously. Only reason or only the understanding cannot be. That is impossible. And Kant, as I said before, to come back to this, well, Kant runs into the contradiction or the antinomy because he wants to avoid it. That's the aporia of Kant. By the way, to some degree, that that feeds into, that bleeds into the natural sciences, where the where representations rule and where um, there, it's it's an organization of representation. So Hegel does not avoid the principle of non-contradiction, or that's. More, preci more precisely, Hegel does not try to avoid den Widerspruch, the contradiction, at all, because, well, that would be, I don't think I can say it because, but this is what allows him to solve the antinomies. The contradiction, der Widerspruch, has being and must be thought and hence, through thinking, that again, through the act of reason, of letting go, must be let go. The contradiction with Kant is thought in itself in a pure... Um, no, sorry. Uh, the, with Kant, the understanding, again, the understanding that which corroborates, runs into the contradiction and holds tight to the principle of non-contradiction, that's unquestioned according to its presuppositions, and hence also has to hold on to the contradiction, has to hold on to the antinomies, and can only give us different antinomies, but cannot overcome its own suppositions. What's an example for a contradiction? To say I, for example. To say I is an expressed contradiction because the I posits itself as itself relating to itself. This is an Entgegensetzung. This is an, uh, uh, an, an oppositionality of uh, opposite, opposing itself by itself, as it were. So we just heard that saying I is an expressed contradiction. So, instead of though, instead of stopping there, what Hegel attempts is to see how the contradiction disappeared. The understanding, however, because it has to corroborate, stops short at the contradiction. There is, um, hence, for Kant, the transcendental analytic is what's true. And to transcendental dialectic in the first critique is pure seeming.
semblance is, is just appearance, shine, shining. <laughs> so again, how must we make the beginning? How must we begin? It's necessary to begin in a certain way, being pure being. Maybe, maybe another example before I finally get to being pure being. The rose is red. A is B. Here, a contradiction shows itself, namely through the verb is. There is a being in opposition in one. To say the rose is a rose is a tautology. It is only through the contradiction. So again, so maybe, um, what is the what is the Widerspruch? The Widerspruch, the contradiction, is not nonsense. That's important. Should have probably said this 30 minutes ago, but anyways. The contradiction, the Widerspruch, is not nonsense, but is that which is in opposition placed into one. The rose is red. Redness and rose are entgegengesetztes, are not contradictory, but oppositional. Placed into one, into the red rose. If not, then we just remain with a tautology when we say the rose is the rose or being is being is being is being is being is being is being so the beginning of the science of logic now what becomes visible for hegel is that in the beginning to ward off representation to ward off all presuppositions to ward off anything that could trigger the fancy or or the um, or the imagination emptiness is the beginning he says it this is this emptiness or this empty these leere this which is empty in this way is also above all the beginning of philosophy this this which is simple which has no further meaning so he says the following sein reines sein without any further determination in its immediate sorry in its indeterminate immediacy it is only equal to itself or same to itself and also not unequal to anything other so already we have we've heard indeterminate unequal to as something other immediate etc and it has no difference with itself and also not with within itself um, or to the outside what shows itself is nothingness we'll get to this in a second so the beginning of the of of the um, of the science of logic, we hear the word pure, being, pure being. Pure is to indicate that being and also nothing, as we get to nothing, which is is also indicated as, said as pure nothing. They are not, they're pure in the sense there's no activity here yet. Yet. It, it, activity will come. So uh, the nothing is not as negation at all. There's, there's no annihilation nor nor any negating or anything. So the beginning of uh, the of the science of logic with pure being again tries to get to the question itself of beginning. There is um, again principles, as I said before. I think I indicated this as beginning are arbitrary. They're completely contingent, and they're not. Again, they they can't. They're not, they're not an absolute ground. This is not to say that Hegel is after an absolute ground to begin. No, I'm not, this is not what I'm saying. 
but first principles are arbitrary and are taken nonetheless as absolute grounds which they are not this is what hegel shows us pure being is the beginning without any mediation without any determinacy it is the unmediated immediate itself philosophy namely cannot begin with an hypothesis the absolute cannot make the beginning cannot be the beginning that would be a hypothesis this is the well not the mistake but this is the operatic nature of Kant's and fichte's thinking that it's ultimately still hypothetical it is by the way also what we learn in plato's from plato's three analogies read the ending of book seven in plato's republic the hypothetical method namely is hypothesis right to hypo means below to uh, to, to ground and the thesis is uh, a statement so the hypothetical method is a going back to the ground between hypothesis and result so it's always going to be trapped somewhere in between between its own presupposition and that which towards it strives but with hegel there is a circle or a cycle it's pure imminence not a not an oscillating back and forth but it's a movement that's cyclical i am to some degree we can see this this attempt already with the pure eye in fichte the pure eye however is turns out to be also um in in fact turns out to be as well uh, hypothetical so we don't really have to uh, worry too much about it uh, here but it is it is of course thanks to fichte that hegel can get to uh, where he wants to get where he wants to get i have to be very careful um well where, he, where, he, where hegel can begin to see how thinking thinks itself hmm? how thinking thinks itself in pure imminence without having to hypothesize for example, it could be an hypothesis to presuppose the origin or an original form and then try and move back to it. Again, with Hegel, we begin with this empty. And as we push forward, as thinking moves forward through collapse and combination and memory and forgetting, of course, also, and vanishing and resurfacing, we get closer and closer through this movement to the origin rather than having presupposed the origin as a thing somewhere behind us. The movement here is such that we don't really begin with being pure being, but as I said before, we ask for how to find the beginning how to make the beginning, how to be open to the beginning. That's the beginning. It's the question itself that leads to this open question that leads to being pure being. It's not, again, that being is positive. It's the question itself, that's the movement, that leads to immediate being pure being. Because philosophy is is in the task, has the job to rein in all presuppositions or else it is again falling back just into hypothetical positings and it cannot become then the, in that sense, and really the ground for, for the sciences. So das Anfängliche, that, that which is the inceptual. Being means, being means to be inceptual. Being means to be inceptual. And, 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 and philosophy itself begins with the question for the Arche, for the origin. That's what it begins with. The question of philosophy from the beginning is what is the Arche? What is 
the beginning. So, what this shows us is that in <clears throat> is that we we must move in such a way into thinking. By the way, formal logic itself, of course, is is an entrance way into speculative thinking. It's not to say formal logic is wrong. It is through formal logic that we can enter into speculative thinking. So also, again, representation, understanding, corroboration, etc. All of these necessary moments to get into the Arche, to some degree, of course, also all the hypothesis, to find an access, though, into the Arche that then shows itself, not by having it presupposed, but by coming about unfolding out of this inceptual way of thinking. To think inceptually means to think without tradition. To think inceptually means to think without tradition, while at the same time not to be cut off from that which is, what that which has been thought, but what shows itself is all of what has been thought bubbling up again through this inceptual thinking. An external superficial way of looking back over the so-called history of philosophy. There is no history of philosophy. Forget it. There isn't. There is no history of philosophy. There is no history of ideas. And we can trace how they develop and unfold. That's all extremely superficial reification. What there is, is thinking. And thinking thinks itself. And as it thinks itself, what bubbles up again is the Arche itself. What else should there be? The origin shows itself through inceptual thinking. There can't, there can't be anything else that shows itself if it is a genuine thinking that thinks itself, that is allowed to be incepted into its inception. And hence, every category that unfolds in the science of logic is a memory of the collapse and the vanishing and, and the enriching that comes at the same time from before. So, conceptual thinking does not mean to be cut off entirely from tradition, but to forget it. And in this forgetting, it returns. The superficial representational way of reifying into, you know, thinking into a history of philosophy looks at, oh, what is it that Locke is saying? And this is then what uh, Hume is saying, and this is then what Kant is saying. And that's fine, that's an entry point. But to come to delve into thinking itself, that occurs somewhere else. That occurs in the inception. In the inception, that means to push everything aside, ask for the inception itself, make that inception, be open to it, to it only to see, without guarantee, of course, that it all is bubbling up again but then but then in a new light in an inceptual light and no longer just taken as um, something that's already known or something that can be re uh, compared with something else or as something that can be refuted but Aristotle is wrong and Plato was wrong and this that and the other that's that's all nonsense all of it nonsense it is a complete destruction of thinking it is so superficial and external um, that it's, it's, well, what can you say? Anyway, so, inceptual thinking. Um, by the I mean, of course, obviously, uh, you know, postmodernism, uh, it, it goes completely against this. It has to. It has to go against the origin. It has to go against inceptual thinking. And hence, it, it ends up in these ridiculous critical uh, um, um, genealogies you know, the way you trace everything, blah, 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 blah. But it, but it doesn't show any validity. A genealogy never, never can have any validity. You, you, can, you can show anything almost in terms of genealogy, but why should I believe that? Why should it be true? Why should it even just be valid? So again, the determinant is always already mediated. So it cannot be the starting point, is not immediate. Hence, beginning must be presuppositionless. 
But for Schelling, as I mentioned before, the logic has a goal, but not for Hegel. To start with indeterminacy, being, right, that indicates a sheer indeterminate being in the beginning, the simple being of thought, the thought of being, pure being, let's derive that logic, the entire richness from this presuppositionless emptiness. But of course, there is a presupposition, which again is language itself, is the vernacular, which is already breathing enriched with originality or origin, the source, the wellspring itself, that that thinking lets to needs to, has to let rise and arise. And this is exactly, I think, what happens in the logic. Freedom comes from letting go. And so it is an act of freedom, the logic. Nothing comes in because here there is nothing to be seen in being. It's only the pure, empty intuition. There is what 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 being then shows itself as is it shows itself as nothingness or the nothing. And hence the logic has to move on. The understanding would like to stay with being pure being, while the logic itself now says well, sorry, the reason allows for a moving on just to consider nothing, the nothingness. Nothing, pure nothing, is the pure or simple sameness with itself. Complete emptiness. Empty of all determination and content. Undifferentiated within itself. So it shows itself to be nothing. Now, the understanding and the representation wants to ward off against this. Again, why? Because the representation would, for example, say, as Hegel himself remarks in, in, in one of the, the, the notes later on, he says, Sein und Nichtsein ist dasselbe, being and nothing is the same. Hence, it is also the same whether I am, whether, hence it doesn't matter, I'll just say, uh, whether I am or I am not, whether this house is or is not, whether these hundred um, gold coins are or are not. This conclusion or application of the sentence of the proposition changes its sense entirely and completely and totally. The sentence being and not being is the same, however, contains the pure abstractions of being and nothing. The application, which is an act of the representation, so be very worried whenever people say anything, applied anything, you know, um, it turns it into a determined being and a determinate nothingness. However, we do not here consider determined, determinate being or determinate nothingness. Hence, it is not about saying that I am or I am not is the same, it's, it, it's completely indifferent, because we're not yet even in the point of anything just abstractly determinate. It's to, to applications are often, you know, when you hear applied history, applied philosophy, applied this and the other, these are abstractions. These are representational ways of of, of, of modeling the world and such, and putting everything into a procrustes bed. What we are dealing with here, what we are attempting here, is to think being pure being, which shows itself to be nothing. So reason lets go and allows to think nothing, without any determination. So it turns out to show itself as rather close to being, pure being, for both of them are utterly indeterminate, utterly undifferentiated, utterly immediate. And hence, nothing without determination, or rather without, um, sorry, it is, is exactly as determinate, as determinationless, apologies, as pure being. And so we move on, or the logic moves on, to the following. P 
pure being and pure nothing are therefore, or is therefore, the same. And here, there is a vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being, which Hegel calls becoming. Becoming is a Bacantian, Bacantian Dionysian um, chaos. It's a bit of a topsy, tipsy-turvy. It's uh, becoming is also, that's important, becoming is the first real concrete category of the logic. That means it's the first, it's grown together. It has grown together. Um, so congratulate again. Becoming is the growing together of being and nothing vanishing into it. And this vanishing of being and nothing being is not substance, of course, etc. None of this is presupposed. And nothing is also not stable at all. This this instability of the two, that, that being and nothingness allow for, this this vanishing both back forth into the other and the other back into the into the next, that let's be becoming become, as it were, that's not a failure. That's success. This collapse is a success, and it moves already the necessity of the logic further towards determinacy because becoming cannot remain pure becoming becoming is in fact needs to turn out to be becoming something if it didn't it would collapse back into being and nothing all right this will continue at some point i'd like to thank you very much for listening to me as i said in the beginning if you could please support my work in any way you can it'd be ever so thankful to you and also there is a course on German idealism where we go into this a bit further so do find all the details in this chest below in the description of this video and I hope that you see a bit the difference between representation which is everywhere and genuine thinking thank you very much indeed